Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Christian Harloff. Hello, welcome back to another episode of Collider Movie Talk, and man, we are right after we're fresh off of seeing Batman v Superman, and to let you guys know, we have our non-spoiler review. It's up on the channel right now. If you want to check that out, we will have a spoiler heavy review, and that will be out on Friday. A lot of stuff to talk about with Batman v Superman, and I know you guys are chiming in about it. The internet is going nuts, as it sometimes does. Also here, John Schnepp. That's right. Internet's going nuts. <clears throat> Saw Batman v Superman yesterday. What's your emoji? My emoji's this. <laughs> Mark Ellis, what's your emoji? My emoji was a confused Michael Keaton as Batman. I went back to the glory days of Batman. I didn't go Adam West. That was too hard to do. So I, f I found the perfect Keaton pick to represent my feeling. Hi, Internet. It's good to see you today. We've had a really good 12 hours. All right. Now, before we get into the actual topics that we have that you guys see right over here, we there was another trailer that dropped, Deepwater Horizons, which is the trailer with Mark Wahlberg, with Peter Berg, Directed this movie, mm -hmm. the uh, the oil rig that uh, that had went kaputs a couple of uh, years ago, and then the true story of the heroes that kind of fought their way through it. The trailer itself, I loved, and when Peter Berg does it right, you know, with some, I, I really like Lone Survivor, by the way, and I and working him working with Mark Wahlberg again. I, this is a trailer that I thought was just cut so well and got, the, I think, the intercutting between the, the, the little kid telling the story of the dinosaurs and then showing the, the buildup and the tension of what was about to happen. Because you know from the second that they start talking about it, what's going to happen, yeah. but yet you're still like, okay, okay, how are they going to do this? And then the thing's upside down with the soda. And Wahlberg seems to always be involved in these types of films. He's perfect for them. But I really liked I hadn't heard of this. That you know, I knew that they were talking about doing this movie, but to see it and to know, and I did not know that Peter Berg was doing it mm -hmm. but after seeing this I'm very intrigued to see this movie in September how about yourself yeah I mean I thought it was a good trailer I remember hearing about the Wahlberg and, and Berg shooting this film I guess about a year ago uh, so it's a it's a it's an interesting uh, looking film I don't, I don't know if it's like up my alley to, uh, you know a lot of these disaster type films I'm kind of feeling a little bit uh, burned out by them but this one looks like it's really well made mm -hmm. and uh, it looks I, I'm interested to see it Mark? I mean, Peter Berg's the guy you want doing these kind of movies, though, because he was great. When he did Battleship, not so much based on true events. Right. You know, We don't really need those kind of movies anymore. We have Michael Bay doing Transformers. But when he does stuff like Lone Survivor, which was based on a true story, or even something that felt like it was based on a true story, like a Friday Night Lights, he's so good, and you feel so real. You get attached to the characters in the story, and I'm already there just from watching this trailer. Yeah. Well, you're right, Christian. It was an expertly crafted trailer. Didn't give away too much of what the actual disaster was, what the fall out was what goes into making something like that but I love the way they build the family dynamic and then it expands from there because you forget when you when, when you read about the story on the news you're like oh man that's crazy that's I, I hope everybody gets out okay what's going on you forget that each one of these people on the rig has families that are also feeling those emotions times a hundred thousand so setting that up for us in the very first trailer I thought was very very well done plus it's got a, a killer cast I like yeah. the way the trailer introduced like John Malkovich Kurt Russell yeah. just a lot and a ton Kate of other Hudson. character faces, like really good character actors. They just like do little drops of their faces. So, you know, they're all on that rig and there's going to be a lot of drama involved. It so. also shows you what Pete Berg does. I mean, people know the kind of filmmaker he is. And and again, if, if he puts together when he's really don't I think the, the, the misstep he had was Battleship. You know, that was a couple years. Yeah, ago but come on, guys, you sunk my Battleship. Remember the pegs? From the game with actual weapons, I know it's. I don't know how they got him to do know, Battleship. Horrible. Because Battleship. So the bad. thing about Battleship was that there was a tie. He's got very strong ties to the military. And he yeah. feels very passionate about our military. And I think they probably were like, hey, what if we use some real guys from the Navy to fight aliens yeah. in a board game right, movie? Right. He just didn't hear that last part. Well, but this one looks like it's going to be pretty yeah. good. All right, now to the best dressed woman on the internet, oh, Ashley. Thank you. What do you got? Last night, Warner Brothers <laughs> released their newest trailer from Shane Black's The Nice Guys. The movie is being described as a dark comedy with action set in 1970s Los Angeles. The film's about a down-on-his-luck private eye, played by Ryan Gosling, who must team up with a hitman, played by Russell Crowe, to solve the case of a missing girl and an unrelated death of a porn star. The film also stars Kim Basinger and Ty Simpkins and opens in theaters May 20th. Christian, what are your thoughts on Shane Black's The Nice Guys? 
It was in my most anticipated list, and it stays there. Um, the red band trailer was great. The green band trailer was great. The tone is is, is as consistent as the last one was. The chemistry between Russell Crowe and uh, Ryan Gosling looks off the charts. It looks like a pure Shane Black movie. When he does movies like this, they work. It's it's got everything that Shane Black has with the with obviously the the kind of crazy kooky characters, the death of a porn star or the investigation of a porn, whatever it was. He's always got some either porn star or somebody going after a porn star in one of his movies. <laughs> but this particular movie, what I I love the character of what Ryan Gosling is doing. Mm -hmm. I like that he doesn't have to this time want to play the tough guy that he's just that when he's when he's whining high he's pitched telling, screaming oh, the high pitched screaming <laughs> and he's just apologizing and, and screaming and crying at every every moment but he's playing the comedy. It just looks like a fun, crazy film. What do you think, Mark? Did you say porn star Christian? I did. I'm listening. Yeah, I really <laughs> like this trailer and I've been excited for this movie since I saw the first very the whatever the teaser was yeah. and we got to see what their chemistry was. Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling were like my favorite unsung part of the Oscars because they just came out they presented together and you could just see it live it's like I want to see a movie with just these two guys going at each other now we get to do it I'm concerned about the release date is the only thing for me because it's May 20th it's right smack dab in the middle of blockbuster season I hope the movie does well I hope it gets enough notice I hope they put enough money into the PR campaign to get movie notice if this trailer is any indication they're going to be doing that but you're going to be coming off of May 6th which is Civil War you're going to be going right into there's a Another big comedy that's Neighbors 2 is coming out around the same time. You also have uh, X-Men Apocalypse and things like the next week. So yep. there's a lot of things coming out. I hope you guys make some time to see the nice guys. Yep. Well, with this trailer, I think it's going to get people. It's going to put, put it on the radar. <clears throat> this this uh, this newest trailer just has a ton of memorable lines. Hey, whatever happened to giving me 20 bucks? You know, right, right. It's got so many great little scenes. And it reminds me of the fun that I had when I saw Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. This is Shane Black doing what he does the best having this kind of like a thriller with comedy in it uh russell crowe ryan gosling playing like, like almost ryan gosling against type like kind of like a little bit of a weak scaredy cat you know i it, it made me laugh every time i see any new scenes from this trailer i get a, a nice gut a gut laugh or this real is laugh. Like better than kiss kiss i've never seen it kiss does. kiss bang actually bang. It look like it could be even better because I, I know man. you love it it to me i love kiss I love kiss bang bang you should see that movie mark ellis yeah, it's way worth seeing i'm in a screening room you guys can come over pay i will bucks. see it with you I'm, i can't wait to pay you. i will give you <laughs> commentary i know it's coming it's, it's not even out yet we're in the future right now seeing kiss Com kiss bang yeah. bang at mark ellis's super cube um <laughs> Before uh, nice guys, yeah. For Kiss we, commentary is a great idea, yeah. Kristen. Yep, we will do commentary. You will see it fresh and comment. Yeah. You think I'm going to watch that movie for the first time with you guys? Yeah, yeah. The entire movie. in your ear, with me eating chicken. Yeah. Yep, you Cra always crackling eat something during the potato commentary. chips right yeah. in your ear. Hey, Alice, you like this part? You know? No, we won't do that to Alice. We want him to enjoy the film. <laughs> you will do that to me. Just actually. no, we will not. We'll just like you should see Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and then see the nice guys. Yeah, I think this trailer's fantastic. Um, okay, I'm gonna call an audible here because I, I'm looking at the chat room too. And uh -oh. I, like like I said before, we have our review, our unspoiler review of Batman v Superman uh -huh. up on the channel right now. But I see I see all the comments. People they, they want a, a little bit a little bit of, of Batman v Superman talk. Here. Here. We'll get into. We got to get into a little. Omaha, it, Omaha. Yeah, we'll do a little bit of this audible. This is not scripted. Because, because <laughs> just just to get into. So I, I don't want to go too long. Sure. Because like I said, we have like a twenty-five minute, thirty-minute conversation that you can watch that we right. did last night. But because of we were so excited yesterday when we saw Batman v Superman. Uh, excuse me, when we when we were going to see it before and we saw it. before we saw it on Movie Talk yesterday yeah. when we, we were we were all like okay the hype's here. You guys lost your minds literally live on Movie Talk and you did not recover them the yeah. rest of the day. <laughs> now I, I have a couple questions here too because if you go to the review we were all pretty much uh, 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 let down by the film. Yeah. We were all let down by the film. I still think and I said it in the review and I'll say it again. I think that what it did well. It did set up the DC universe very well. I didn't leave saying, "Oh man, the DC universe is in trouble." Um, I think that there were it had a lot of it had a lot of issues. I thought Bat Ben Affleck was the one of the best Batman that we, we ever had. He was he was the best part of the movie, hands down. It, there was a lot of editing and pacing problems for sure. My question that I want to throw to Snap, Snap first is: You've been thinking about this movie a little bit. Has your score changed? And also. Is Snyder still the guy that should be taking this universe further? Yeah, it's a, it's a rough one because, you know, after we saw, I was really excited to see this film for the last three years. And so yesterday finally showed up. So I knew there was that element that is like, it's not going to live up to what I'm thinking it's going to be or what I what I hope it is. It's just going to be what it is. So I should just get prepared for that. And I was prepared for it. And uh, I walked out of the film 
Uh, and it was a critic screening, so I'm surrounded by a ton of other critics, and they all had their opinions ready to, what did you think? I thought this, so I tried to, I tried to re remove my fr myself from that as much as possible just so I could get my, collect my thoughts, so to speak. And, uh, and honestly, like, you know, you do a review for a film, like even 30 minutes after you've just seen it, you can't really, you haven't soaked it all in yet. And so with saying that, I mean, I still like the film, but I'm gonna lower my, my score from a, a uh, I gave it a seven. I'm gonna lower it to a 6.5. Wow. We're tied. Um, we, we pushed. Yeah. I mean, I've been, you know, I, I'm not going to give it a six right now, but I'm like, you know, I reserve the judgment because I'm going to see it again this Thursday. It's just my opinion. You guys might love it or you might hate it. I liked it because there were such amazing scenes in the film that were really incredibly satisfying. I mean, honestly, the first 30 minutes are incredible. So you'll see our reviews and you're going to go see the movie and you're going to be like, these guys are crazy because right. the first 30 minutes are really solid. There's a few choppy, uneven scenes, even within those first 30 minutes, but overall it stands up. The next two hours, are there's it's filled with a lot of problems. And I, I have to be honest, I feel kind of uneasy about you know, the future of the DC uh, cinematic universe because of the way this film sets up so many things and what it does to set up further things. I don't want to get into spoilers, but the more I thought about it, the more I was like, wow, they really complicated stuff that yeah. they didn't have to. It, I, there's just a lot of stuff in there. So that's why I'm going to lower my my feelings about it a little bit more to, you know, 6.5, which is, I guess, uh, a D if you were going in, if you were in grade school. So. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> ten out of ten, Christian. Next question. That is a that is a filthy lie. No, I uh, I was a little let down by this movie. I'll be honest with you. I couldn't even quite get it to fresh on Rotten Tomatoes simply because I was very entertained watching this movie. I was even like on the edge of my seat because it put so much neat stuff on the screen. I thought Ben Affleck was a kick-ass Batman. I wouldn't quite put him at the level of Christian Bale or Michael Keaton personally. I thought Superman was reliable. I liked what Amy Adams was able to do with Lois Lane. A lot of the performances were awesome. I thought Lex Luthor, the Jesse Eisenberg portrayal of him was uh, was kind of a bummer for me. I didn't like the way they took that character. Um, overall, though, the movie itself just had so many problems that even though I was entertained, for the most part, watching the movie, shoving a lot of popcorn in my face and wondering what's going to happen next, it's got so many flaws and it didn't add up to a good story, or at least a digestible format for me, that I was like, I, this, is, this is fun, but it's not a good film. So even though it does set up a great DCU in the future, which I have a lot of confidence in, I'm looking forward to Justice League more after watching this movie than I was before watching this movie. I just couldn't see this as being a good movie. Yeah, there's just going to be a lot of questions, man. I mean, look, we're going to see, and I think it goes back to what Schnepp said, you guys can go out and see this movie and love it. And think because this happened with Man of Steel as well, too. I mean, you're talking to two guys here that saw Man of Steel and really enjoyed the film. Although I think Schnepp, when you saw the film, said you were thinking about it a little bit yeah. and then came back Honestly, to it. Honestly, that's why I want to see. I'm going to see Batman v Superman tomorrow. I already have my tickets for it. And I, you know, I might even like it more. And I might all of a sudden be like, hey, it's like a B minus now that I, because there's so, it's a dense film. There's so much happening. And there's a lot of things that, you know, I'm not going to change my mind about the way it's cut. It's very sloppily cut. Yeah. There's a lot of disjunctive edits and strange decisions that, you know, maybe we'll be that we'll find out more when we talk later in months to the filmmakers and the producers why those things happened. Was the three hour version the definitive version and they actually cut out scenes that would have helped make this a smoother film? For the, you know, for just because a three hour film, you get less box office. I understand all that. So it's like, it just feels like very uneven. I got to stick to that, and I got to say, Ben Affleck and Wonder Woman are fantastic in it. I think the I Superman, really like Gal Gadot as well. Yeah, Gal Gadot too, yeah. is amazing. I thought, and I think she's a great actress in this too, mm -hmm. bar whatever anyone else says. Mm -hmm. I think her scenes really resonate, and they they stand out. And so do any scene that Batman is in. Ben Affleck kills it as Batman. Uh, I think, and those these certain Batman standalone scenes, which we won't talk about, are fantastic. Right. I mean, they're literally like, wow! If only the rest of the movie had this kind of pacing. So there's a lot of pacing issues. Yeah, and, and that's, but we'll find out what's going to happen as the movie comes out, how it does with the box office opening weekend. It's going to be incredible. We know that. And then we'll see the fan reaction overall and see what you guys think. And then I think the questions are going to start to come because we will get the standalone Batman movie by Ben Affleck, which right. who's not going to be excited about that? Um, then you're going to see the Wonder Woman movie, which I think that the Wonder Woman scenes will set up the excitement for the standalone film on that. So I think it did its job. <laughs> 
great there. It just the Justice League questions for me. I'm curious what's going to happen. Will Snyder still be the guy? Will he not? We'll find out. Oh, you know, I wanted to add too. I, you know, I had made. Uh, I thought this movie might make 200 million, but now after seeing the film, oh, what does Nostradamus say now? Well, I, I'm not doing <laughs> Nostradamus. I'm just saying I feel like because of the reactions, especially how I felt after seeing it, and then people always ask other people, "What do you think? Should I go see it?" And like something like Deadpool, just from Watching the trailers and feeling like the the build up to it, it felt like wow, that's going to make a lot of money, and the the, the goodwill of people saying you got to see this is going to continue. With this one, it's going to be fifty fifty. Yeah. I feel, and it's like, you know, I feel like, hey, if you love Batman and Superman, you should see this film. If you're on the fence, you could wait. You know, it's worth yeah, seeing in the theater. I'd also so. say, I mean, look, I had two hundred million dollars, and I'll stick with that for now. But like the fact that I think one of you guys brought it up on the review last night is like, is like this is not a kid friendly movie. You want to take right. your kids to see? That's fine. I don't care what you do with your kids. It's a dreary. It's a very dreary. It's film. a tough yeah. one, and and I don't know the kids going to walk out of this movie screaming, "Oh, we got to go right back in," like they might have done with another comic book movie. I wanted um, to. I wanted to make two hundred million. I think it's going to make one hundred twenty-five million. Hmm. All right. So there you go, guys. There was a little special treat for you guys who are asking for Batman v Superman talk. If you want to see even more, like I said before, the non-spoiler review. It's up right now with myself, Mark Ellis, John Schnepp, Dennis, and John Campia. We all talked about it. Go over there and check it out. And then our spoiler heavy review will be up on Friday. So that was a little special treat for you guys. You guys were asking for it. Now, what's next, Ashley? With Star Wars firmly launched to great success over at Disney, they are next turning their attention to Nina Jones with another movie release date set for July of 2019. Harrison Ford will reprise his role as the famous archaeologist and is excited to do so. <clears throat> During an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel Live and referencing Nina Jones 5, Ford said he'll be ready and is excited for the opportunity to work with Steven Spielberg again on his character. He said, The chance to revisit this character, which has brought pleasure to so many people, not to mention me. It's great fun to play this character. It's great fun to work with Steven. I'm looking forward to it. Schnapp your thoughts on Harrison Ford's comments to Jimmy Kimmel. Hey, I'm glad Harrison Ford wants to play Indiana Jones again. He said the same thing about the Crystal Skull. It doesn't like, look, he wasn't the problem in Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. That He's Indiana Jones. He did everything that we expected Indiana Jones to do. He is Indiana Jones. So he's going to play Indiana Jones in this fifth one. You know, my seat, I'm in there. I'm seeing it. Opening <laughs> night. We're all going to see it. We love the character. My issues are like rehiring David Cope. I don't know his, how you Cope. say it. Cope. He wrote Crystal Skull. He also wrote a lot of other amazing scripts, but it just feels like, couldn't they have just gotten someone else to just, I mean, just like, it just feels like, really? That's how I feel about it. So I, I guess I just, you know, so disappointed with that fourth film that, you know, and the fifth film is like, what, coming out in 2048 or something, like 500 <laughs> years from now? It just feels like it's so far away when they announce these things. Yeah, we've got it. We're going to 2030. What is it? 2000, Eight, 2019. 2019. Oh, wait, 19. Yeah. All right. Whatever. July of 2019. Years, so yeah. once you get to 2019, you still got a cool six months yeah, to shave wait. your head, go to sleep for four years. <laughs> for four right? years. That's what you're going to have to <laughs> yeah. do. Well, David Cope, by the way, to, to be fair to him, you know, it, everybody was under the, the rule of Lucas, though, during there. So if, he, if, he, if Lucas wanted to put the gophers looking up, but the sky, then that's what he's going to put in there. So I mean, you know what? A, I'm not going to blame Lucas I'm not, on this. I, I'm going to give. I'm not. Lucas I'm going to give him story, split. Story only. Lucas also came up with the amazing Raiders of the Lost. You know, there are meetings. Yeah. Um, I need you to make sure that no, there's a refrigerator. No, I know. But David, I'll, no, David, I'll fire you right was, off the set. The refrigerator was Frank Darabont's script. Mm -hmm. Remember, like yeah. the entire the, the Crystal Skull is a Frankenstein job. It's like three scripts right. like, cut together and like we got to start filming it. That's what that movie is. It was. I think it was a rare example of Steven Spielberg not being able to exert his will. Yes, uh, and dominance over a movie script entirely, and you could definitely tell that when you watch it now. And it took so long to make. That's the other reason. It took yeah. forever to make that film. Yeah, right. but when you look at this going forward, first of all, I hope that they give Indiana Jones Han Solo's jacket from The Force Awakens. All you need to do is put the hat on him, and it's pretty much indie. But yeah, I mean, look, of course, Harrison Ford is going to be happy to be playing this role again. It's an iconic role, and I think that his experience on The Force Awakens is one of the reasons why he's so up for doing this again, because Disney got Got it right as far as making that movie, uh, you know, catering to his needs besides a broken leg. And then when they went on the press tour, he seemed to be having a ball. And it's like, I, it, it almost seemed like there was a tinge of, of regret that he might not get to do this that many more times with these characters that are so universally loved. So why not jump back in the other pool that you know is going to be a guaranteed hit? And I think we're going to like this movie a lot more than Kingdom of Crystal Skull. Again, we got four years to fix whatever right. problems are with David Kep's script right now. But I, of course, Harrison Ford's going to be pumped. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I think that the thing going on in his comments, he's always, to me, seemed like he has related or responded or had more fun playing Indiana Jones than he did Han Solo. He's always wanted to play that character. And I think that there was rumors that he, he when he made his deal to play Han Solo again, that he would do it as long as he was guaranteed that he could play Indiana Jones again. And those rumors look like they kind of came true because here we go. We got that that announcement that he is indeed going to be playing Indiana Jones once again. Um, you know, he also mentioned something about the young Han Solo and they asked him as well. And he, and he kind of made a joke. They said a new Han Solo and he said, Correction, a young Han Solo. <laughs> and um, so when, uh, you know, there, he made a couple comments there, and I think that he, I don't know if he seemed to be, he was kind of joking around or a little, uh, you never can tell if he's salty or joking around that he didn't know if it was a, uh, the great idea to do it, but it was such brief comments that he's, he's been cracking a lot of jokes lately. But man, I'm, I'm on board for him playing Andy. I'm just hoping. I am just hoping that we get that vision that we're hoping for is the old with the new. The don't do it. That, don't you don't need to do that with Die Hard, but you can do it with Indiana Jones. Right. Let's see him old. <laughs> and this is not a double standard. This is just a smart decision. It's, it just yeah, makes it just more makes sense, sense to do it this way. Yeah. And it, wor it, it even worked when he was younger, and they did it with the Last Crusade with the late River mm -hmm. Phoenix. Totally. Um, okay. What's next? Warner Brothers has announced that Ben Affleck's long-awaited directorial follow-up to Argo: Live by Night has been given the Oscar-friendly release date of October 20th, 2017. Affleck writes, produces, directs, and stars in the Dennis Lehane adaptation, which follows the son of a Boston police captain in the 1920s as he makes the rise from bootlegger to notorious gangster. Live by Night also stars Sienna Miller, Zoe Saldana, Al Fanning, and Brendan Gleeson. Mark, what do you think of the prime Oscar release date for Ben Affleck's Live by Night? I love it, man. If, you're, if you, you think you need a hit, you go back to the city that made you great, and that would be Ben Affleck going back to Boston. Work for Goodwill Hunting, certainly work for the town and he's back again near Fenway Park to do this movie. I think that cast alone sounds like it could be an Oscar caliber. Then when you're thinking about that story, man, it's such an interesting time in American history, particularly when you when you factor that into the town of Boston, something that we've seen bootlegging movies around that time and bootlegging shows like Boardwalk Empire, but I am not that familiar with the bootlegging landscape as it was in Boston in the 1920s, yeah. which is interesting because the Ellis family actually started up in Boston around that time. Yeah. We were ice cutters in the 1920s, so nice. uh, maybe Ellis Pond factors in there somewhere. It's just outside Watertown. Check it out. I would love to do something where actually you could do some ice cutting here on set one day, like ice sculptures and <laughs> Was stuff. Was that a challenge? Yeah. We didn't do ice sculptures, <laughs> oh, Christian. We can you make ice. me a Yoda ice sculpture? Yeah, can you do ice sculpture? Because I would... Or you just maybe a tiny chewy. Bastardizing face. my family's history. Then 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 refrigeration got invented and ice cutting wasn't as big anymore. But back in the day, oh, uh, there go the teeth. There go the teeth. Walks right. off set. Right. Now I will tell you that I am very, very excited about this because I think all of his movies so far have been set in the Boston area. Gone Baby Gone. Right, right, well. right. Um, and he's going back there. And I think you talk about with Harrison Ford, how there was something in the deal. There was something again in the deal with, they probably said, absolutely, whatever mm -hmm. you want to do with Ben Affleck because of the, he's had such great success as a director. But this sounds great, man. And I, this is the movie and he wants to tell. And we were just saying before in the review that maybe Snyder, Zack Snyder is not the best storyteller, um, but he's great with visuals. I think Ben Affleck is a great storyteller and has been so far in the three movies. So to see his storytelling will actually get me more excited for even like a standalone Batman film because like, this will be one of the last mm -hmm. ones that he does not one of the last ever but before he gets in I think he's going to start going into the big blockbuster movies and starting with the, I'm the excited Batman I'm movies. glad you brought up the town I love that movie I thought the town director's cut was incredible if you haven't seen it check out the director's cut it's fantastic yeah. and he's writing and directing this film and starring in it so this is like you know the triple threat it sounds fantastic I love films once again uh, that are set in this era, like Lawless, like all the, you know, this, so I, I think this, everything about this has got me really excited. I yeah. can't wait. Well, I hope you guys enjoy the movie with warm <laughs> drinks because you're not getting any ice. Oh, oh. you're a mean person. <laughs> you're so I was talking about my family's oh, history. Man. You guys attacked me. Oh, Ashley, would man. you like some ice? I just don't know what an ice cutter does. I'm not really like, sure. What, what? It, I'm not really Ashley, sure. let me tell you what ice Can cutter you make used a, to be. <laughs> it's like they didn't have actual refrigerators, so you would get a block of ice right. and a dude would walk it up yeah. many steps to whatever floor 
floor you lived on and give you this block of ice. You'd put it in a box, <laughs> yeah. which was mm -hmm. what a refrigerator was, and that would put keep all your meats and everything. Hence cold. the term ice box. Ice box. Oh wow, Bango. that's rough work. Yeah, yeah. And the Ellis's made, made yeah. sure you yeah. had hands. cold drinks. Uh, no, Thank the, you, the, Ellis's. Those are, those are little hands. These are ice cutting hands. Very little hey. hands. Okay. <laughs> you would be like chopping them, right? Yeah. <laughs> Stay on target. <laughs> Moving on to buy or sell. Um, this is pretty simple. Ash is going to read some more topics in the world of movie news, and Mark, myself, and Mr. Schnepp are not going to do chipmunk faces. We are going to either buy or sell the Oh, they're the so funny, topics. though. Aren't uh, they great? Come on, Ellis. So do a great. chipmunk come face. Do it. Do it. Oh, there we boo. go. <laughs> That's a half, half chipmunk. All right, right Ashley. Put some effort chipmunk. into it. Ashley, what's up first? Well, one of the more interesting <laughs> films <laughs> that yeah, that Franco That's has right. attached himself to as an actor and director is The Disaster Artist, a movie about the true story behind the making of Tommy Wiseau's infamous film, The Room. Based on the nonfiction book of the same name, Franco is also producing alongside Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. Collider's own Steve Weintraub spoke with James Franco at the press day for the Adderall Diaries, and the filmmaker revealed that none other than Tommy Wiseau has a cameo in the movie as a <laughs> contractual obligation saying I'm editing it now it turned out great I play Tommy Wiseau my brother Dave Franco plays Greg Sestero the other actor in the room Tommy was involved contractually we had to give him a cameo opposite <laughs> me which was very weird because I was playing him I don't know if that'll end up in the movie or not but it was a surreal experience to say the least Christian Byersell Tommy Wiseau's contractual appearance in the disaster are artist. you kidding me I buy this more than I've ever bought anything on this show this is amazing and I would feel I would feel cheated if I didn't hear that Tommy Wiseau asked contractually to be in this yeah. film of course of course he did. It's perfect. Oh, hi, James. Put me in film. Uh, I would love to see it. I hope it happens. I hope they don't cut it out. I think oh. fans will be excited to see him flub his lines or whatever it is and just be completely horrendous. I don't care if it takes me out of the movie for a second. I want to hear him say, oh, hi. Like, whatever it is, or just say mm. something. Like my, the, I watch over and over again that I did not hit her. I did not. It's yeah. so amazing, yeah. his delivery. So to, to have James Franco as Tommy Wiseau, next to Tommy Wiseau. Yes, and I love the fact that he made himself have a cameo in it. And I love that they probably were cracking up, him and uh, James James Franco and Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogen, were, the conversations they must have had oh. about this guy. Those alone, I would love to see on the Blu-ray. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I, like, I haven't seen The Room, so I'll watch that right after I watch Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. But it's uh, it makes sense. It, if he made The Room was his baby, so yeah. contractually, he should have something in the movie, <laughs> and you should not be able to cut it out either. You right. should be by law. You should have to put that scene in the theatrical release of this film. It'd be the same thing, Christian. Yeah. There's a cult movie going around called Windy City Heat, right? I've heard oh, of it. Too. I love that movie. He made a oh, big bunch so of Windy City Heat with a bunch of action stars, you would have to give Perry a cameo in that and give Don and Mole because they that's their oh. thing that they did. So they earned it like Tommy Wiseau earned a role in this movie. Oh, yep. my God. The Room, if you haven't seen The Room, you got to see it in a theater with a bunch of other people. You have to, you have to do that. Um, yeah, we got to do a commentary on it. We have to have Tommy Wiseau sitting with us contractually. That's I would happen. love Are you <laughs> kidding me? I'd love to get him on this I show. I think James Franco is a genius. Thank you for making this film. I think all of his decisions as an artist and a director are really great. And uh, I, I have your solution for you. Do not cut him out. Just put that scene unedited during the credit sequence. Oh, what yeah. the entire, whatever it is, 10 minutes, to un, like take one, take two, whatever it is, you, you side by side with Tommy Wiseau, that would be the best way. Because if it's not fitting in the film, you could squeeze it in in the credits and everyone would stay and see all the credits through 10 minutes of credits <laughs> no. to watch all of that flavor happening. You know, I cannot wait to see this I movie. don't know how the movie's going to do at the box office, but I guarantee you the Blu-ray or whatever the home disc sales are, it's oh. going to be incredible yeah. because you're probably going to have a lot of bonus features. They might even work out a deal with him to put the room oh. on the Blu so you can watch. So like, good. Yeah, they're, they're, it's going to be a good one now. Uh, all right, what's next? Following the disappointing box office opening of the recent Divergent series sequel, Allegiant, this past weekend, a report by THR says that Lionsgate will reduce the budget to the last film, Ascendant. Though the report doesn't reveal numbers, sources believe Allegiant's budget was around $110 million, which could now drop to as low as $85 million for Ascendant. The movie opened this past weekend to its lowest total yet in the series, with $29.1 million, down 44% from the previous insertion 
Resurgence 52 million opening. Age of Adeline director Lee Tolan Krieger takes over Ascendant with a release set for June 9, 2017. Schnett Byers saw Lionsgate slashing the budget to Ascendant. Yeah, I buy it. I mean, it makes sense. They're like looking at the box office as a business. They're like, hey, the, it's it's starting to wear off the Divergent fans. And, you know, we see the box office dropping every every sequel. This is our third sequel. We've got a fourth one in the pipeline. Can we cut a couple of scenes and maybe, maybe reduce the budget? Because maybe by the time the fourth one comes out next year, it's not going to crack 15, 20 million overall with all the way they sell everything overseas. We will get our money back, but we, let's just make let's play it safe. So it makes total sense to me. I think it makes complete sense. Because, like you said, it's a business and they're looking at it. They're going, we're putting X amount of money in here. We're not getting it back. If we slash a little bit off mm -hmm. here, we could probably still make a, a, a profit on this thing because people are are not responding to it it's just you know, the, the hardcore fan base is going and they're like well we can still adhere to the the hardcore fan base here give them what we want and not lose money on it because we're not getting the new audience that we want with the extra money that we're spending i'd even say 60 million would be a safe thing they're guessing at what it, they're slicing it's, it to it, they should cut it by half it'd probably be a little tougher now because you're you're in your fourth movie the actor salaries are probably a little higher now because right. you're in the fourth film so right. it, your actor's budgets go up a little bit so this is probably the most they could cut because trust me they're probably cut as much as they could and yeah. said look this is not making the money we want so i think it makes a lot of sense to cut it it's a big buy for me they are cutting this budget like it's a block of ice in Watertown. <laughs> Damn, um, call back. Call back. But you know, it sounds like maybe there's some people that are going to start this movie out that aren't going to survive till the end. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we don't have to pay you that much. Let's just go ahead and kill your character off. It's the last movie. So I buy that they're cutting the budget. You know what I don't buy at all is the release date. June 9th? Are you kidding wow. me? You're putting this movie where you're slashing the budget. They've had diminishing returns on every film and you're going to release that in the heart of the summer blockbuster mm. season? That is maybe that's why they're cutting the budget because that's what their release date is it's a very very sketchy thing going on with this shit just just don't even don't even have scenes anymore just have the actors in a table read just do that just have the just have all the famous people they have to pay a lot of money to have them sit in a room read the script thank you for coming bye yeah um, all right, what's next? When news broke that Suicide Squad director David Ayer was attached to direct Will Smith and Joel Edgerton in a supernatural cop flick called Bright, which was at the center of a bidding war among studios, many assumed he would agree to stay at Warner Brothers. Surprising to everyone, however, Ayer decided on Netflix. In an interview with Deadline, the Bright director and co-writer said it all came down to creative freedom. He said, I was after the creative freedom, the ability to make really hard R-rated movies, with vision and voice and see them play in the on-demand world. When asked about Netflix as a platform for movie releases and the future of streaming, Ayer said, Netflix is deeply biting into cable viewership, and it's clearly the future of the entertainment industry, which is on-demand and portable devices. To bring a flagship project into that world and have the opportunity to be the tip of the spear, I felt like we were given a hunting license to be truly creative and to do what I love. Mark Byersell, David Ayer's comments on Netflix. I just I love when David Ayer talks. Like he talks, he makes a point, then he just keeps talking and he stumbles back <laughs> into the point. And then we're talking about hunting licenses by the end of it. I love what you're doing, dude. I buy these comments. It's the right play to take something like this to Netflix. If they're gonna give you the most creative freedom, think about that story. If it's like uh, you know end of watch and but you're hunting like you know the ghouls or whatever the you know fairies or whatever you're going after if you need the reins to be loosened by the studio and say no you guys go with it make whatever you want we trust in you if netflix is the one that's doing that and they're at the foremost of this then have at it man i am so excited about this project partially because it is coming to netflix yeah, I buy these comments as well. And I also think there's a couple of things that's funny, though, too, because he almost just kind of he says that they're the tip of the spear, kind of the first people to do it. He's like, get out of the way, Adam Sandler, because Adam Sandler did. They, they tried it. It didn't work. But Adam Sandler was also in a position in his career that David Ayer is not. David Ayer is a guy right now that is Suicide Squad is going to do very well. Doesn't matter whatever the because Batman v Superman is going to do really well, and whatever the the critics and the fans think, even if the fans wind up not liking it, they're still going to be pumped mm -hmm. for Suicide Squad. That movie's going to do very well. So he has the opportunity right now to say, "I'm am set up in the feature film world to release in theaters if I want to, but I'm going to take this risk. I'm going to do this project the way I want to do it. Explore Netflix, 
be the guy that basically says, look, you're going to put some great stuff on there. There's great TV on there. I'm going to put the first like great movie on there. But it's like you also had um, the, the Idris Elba. Mm. Uh, what was the – help me out here. The one that just uh, got released. Beast of No Nation. Oh, Thank right. you. Um, but that was also – that had a, a th limited theater right. release as well. This is, this is for Netflix, sold to Netflix the same way. <clears throat> so I think that Air could be the guy that really brings in this fantasy – world dark movie and and going past the, the reins of like the mpaa and all that stuff too so it's going to be interesting I, I really buy the comments now isn't this a series not a just one film this is a series i thought it? it was a movie i believe it's I a it was film. just a, just the one film, film. Yeah. just one movie wow okay yeah yeah, I, I still yeah, you're buy Will it. Smith, you're Joel Edgerton. They're yeah. not. They're not hanging out for 13 episodes. Right. Yet. Well, I wish they were. But <laughs> uh, I still, I'm 100 percent into it. I, for some reason, I thought, yeah, it's like three standalone films. I guess it's not. But uh, doesn't disappoint me. I'm really excited about this film. It sounds like a crazy idea. It comes from Max Landis. Obviously, it's going to be fun. Uh, and getting uh, air and all the talent on there. Let it be R-rated. Let it be, you know, no strings attached. Let right. it just be what it has to be. And the and, and the place that you can do that now is a Netflix or, you know, a lot of these other streaming services that are popping up right now are giving artists the chance to have that kind of freedom that kind of isn't there in the bigger in the bigger. Is there studios. any sort of rating system on Netflix? I'm trying to remember. Is, is, is there anything that even says like parents don't let your mature, kids watch this? There's got to be like, like mature or something though too because I mean. Oh yeah, it says for like mature audiences yeah, or yeah, something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. You, but you, nobody you, pays attention. Well, that's that. what I mean. Like movies are already, uh, you know, PG, PG-13 or R and they say that on Netflix. But if Netflix is making it themselves, right. they just put yeah. it for mature audiences. Well, you look at, so, look at Daredevil. Yeah. You know, Daredevil is a perfect example too because I mean, look what Daredevil did this season. Yeah. Um, they stepped it up in terms of the, the violence and, and the graphic, to be honest. Uh, we'll see what exactly David Ayer does. Okay, now it's time for Rewind, brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theaters. We talk about the movies that came out 10 years ago, 20 years ago. There were quite a few of them. Ashley, what came out 10 years ago? 10 years ago, it was Inside Man and Larry the Cable Guy Health Inspector. Ooh, tough Ooh. call. On what about 20 years ago? 20 years ago, Flirting with Disaster and Diabolic. Okay, so for me, the one that stands out, honestly, is Inside Man, a Spike Lee film. I, I actually think that this is an, a very underrated film. I think that it's, it's a bit predictable when you watch it, that you kind of kind of know what's going to happen, but I think that it's set up well. I think it's a movie that Spike Lee doesn't get enough credit for. Because it is, even though it's a little predictable, it's a really well done movie. I think Clive Owen was really good in the movie as well. Um, and it's the one that I, I can't believe it's 10 years old because I remember reading the script for that movie right. and then coming back to see it. And, and I thought it, it transferred over very well from script to film. Uh, Larry the Cable Guy, Health Inspector. I, I, I don't know what that is. 20 years ago, um, <laughs> Flirting with Disaster. <laughs> <laughs> that that was one flirting with disaster. Everyone that gives Ben Stiller a lot of credit for that film because it, you saw a little bit more of his dramatic chops in that movie. And then Sharon Stone and Chaz Palminteri trying to get it going and oh, doesn't yeah. get going. Uh, Schnapp, what stands out? <clears throat> I love flirting with disaster. <clears throat> I'm sure you do. Yeah, it was David Russell's a great film for him. Had a lot of crazy scenes. I think that was the one with like, are you gonna do? Have you done this acid? Remember they show up? Yeah, yeah. Acid Town or whatever the weird family with uh, Alan Alda and Lily Tomlin. It was a fantastic film. That stands out to me. Uh, the 20 years ago, Diabolique. I still like the original version way better, which is a 50s kind of. I think it was a French film. Mm -hmm. A better film, Diabolique, same name. And uh, what was the ones from 10 years ago? 10 years ago Larry the was cable an guy Inside Out. Inspector. Yeah. Man, <laughs> that's obviously you remember. it's yep. Cable Guy. Ben Stiller. Right. Uh, oh, wait, that's a different Cable Guy. Yeah, it's right. a different Cable Guy. No, it was Inside, inside Out. Inside, inside Man. Inside Man, right. There we yeah. go. Uh, Marcus Aurelius Ellis? Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember Larry the Cable Guy Health Inspector uh, when it came out because it's like, oh, they're still making these kind of movies where it's like, oh, yeah, we'll take somebody, put them in a premise, see who buys it at Walmart in right. six months. Um, so I remember Inside Man was pretty good. Uh, Forty with Disaster, it's like it's funny when you look back on an actor or actress's career and you kind of see the way like they matriculate before they became huge. So with Ben Stiller, the Ben Stiller show is a very underrated sketch comedy totally. program. And he had things like Reality Bites that were more in the early 90s. And then Fighting with Disaster, you're right. It's like it's a it's a rom-com for sure. But there's also some dramatic stuff in there. And I, that was the year before there's something about Mary. And that catapulted totally. him to like being like one yeah. of the one of the A-listers. So this was him like waiting in the wings to become the star that we know Ben Stiller is today. Definitely. 
All right, now we are going to get to Mailbag, where you guys have submitted emails to us at collider, excuse me, collidervideo.gmail.com. But before we do that, I also want to let you know we're going to be doing live Twitter questions. So all you do there is tweet us at Collider Video. Ashley Mova, a.k.a. The Movenator, will be going through these questions, and she'll pick them out. So be very nice, or she'll never even look at them. <laughs> so, okay, what's up with Mailbag first? All right, Philip C. writes, Hey, guys at Collider. If an author of a book series doesn't want the studio to continue their franchise as a movie or as a television show, does the author have the right to block the studio? And if they don't, are the studios still obligated to pay the author even though they never continued the story beyond the book series well to quote john schnepp you sign that contract son uh if, right. if you sign the contract <laughs> and if you give up the right you make sure your lawyer reads over that contract That's and right. he says we are going to make x amount of movies and do this and have the rights to the tv series or this or that it will be in that contract it will tell you everything that they want to do so even if you don't like the first movie but you signed on to let them make the tv series make comic books make napkins out of your stuff they're going to do it so have your lawyer read the contract but you could after the first movie there might be an option yep. to say okay wait a minute First movie did well. We're going to re renegotiate now. Well, I didn't like how the first movie went, so I'm not going to I'm not going to re up the contract, and I will not allow you to do my book. That normally doesn't happen though, right. because the studios are probably going to say first, no, 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 we'll make this deal with you, but we want the rights to the whole series. Am I close here? Very close, and it's I mean every contract is different, and that's why once you get into the big leagues, you got a lawyer up. You have to have a lawyer. They're your friends because you can't go through like thirty to fifty to five hundred pages of of a document with all these clauses and things. That's what lawyers do. And they can just like skim through stuff and they've, they know all the, all these clauses. And that's why you have to have a lawyer when you actually do get into this kind of situation that with that, it's like, Hey, look, every single contract is different. So what you're asking, there is no one specific way. Anything is ever done. Once somebody could have a book and they're like, Hey, go ahead and adapt it into a movie. You could have all the rights. I don't care. Make whatever you want. Or somebody could be like, you can only do this. It depends also if you're like Stephen King or Bob Scrimby. So if you're Bob Scrimby, be, you probably aren't going to really have that much leverage or any kind of like decision making powers. You'll just be lucky if they wanted to make something out of your book. You'd be like, I'll sign anything. If you're Stephen King, you're like, look, you can you can make this as a television series. The rights revert back to me later. Right. I can then resell it myself for a movie, yada, yada, yada. So it depends on who you are as well. But it's really literally usually those rights and the ability to exploit those rights of whatever it is that you made as a book or a comic book, whatever it is, are there in the contract. And they, that's where they should be because they're paying you you some money to have that flavor and fun. So. Yeah, Stephen King can do whatever he wants, but Bob Scrimby would be like, uh, "Excuse me, sir, I, I would like um, the, the rights to no, back, please. no, is that, is that possible?" And then here's what you get. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just think that maybe we can take it in a different direction, sir. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Your assistant came in the room. You know what's interesting though is that Tom Clancy, Tom Clancy and Harrison Ford famously had like a, they, they like butted heads when they were doing Clear and Present Danger over like how the character Jack Ryan was being portrayed. But because Tom Clancy was a huge name, but because Harrison Ford is a star, it's like, sorry, man, we're, we're, we're making this movie. Right. Sorry, Jack. Yeah. All right, Electro, what's next? <laughs> ah, all right james writes hello collider team i'm a big fan of the show and i watch while i run on the treadmill to help pass the time you run and you walk and be honest <laughs> walk on the treadmill <laughs> i was really looking forward to seeing jeff nichols midnight special this weekend i love his previous film take shelter in mud i thought it opened everywhere on the 18th of march only to be disappointed to find out that it's only in limited release la and new york i live in michigan and have no idea when it will play near me my question is why do some films such as this open in limited release and then slowly expand why don't the studios release the film why to begin with thank you and keep up the great work uh money for marketing it's just they could lose money marketing a yeah. smaller film it's just it's it's harder to do it i mean we we're just talking about kiss kiss bang bang studio had no idea what to do with that movie didn't know who to who to market it to because even though you might want to go see midnight special it might not have that great audience appeal and they might do these polls and and asking audiences like what what the anticipation is that's why the smaller films have done better with the direct to dvd not to dvd direct to tv releases and these streaming releases that's why you see more of that now and that's why just we're talking about with david air going to netflix more people are watching these smaller films there because they're spending because it costs a lot of money to go to the movies now it really does so they're picking movies like batman v superman or the big summer movies to go see stuff in the smaller movies kind 
kind of get left in the dust here. So that's why the studios don't spend that much money to put them in wide release because it costs more money for them to do it. Mark? It's very interesting, though, because when you see the trailer for Midnight Special, you're like, this could be like a big budget summer tent yeah, right. movie. You look at the cast with the premises, but that's not what Jeff Nichols wanted to do with his baby. And James, I, I have some good news for you is that you're in Michigan, right? So it's in more limited release or less limited, I guess, on April 8th. So you can make the three hour drive from Kalamazoo, wherever you are, over to Chicago to see it. Or April 15th, it's going to be everywhere opening uh, along with the Jungle Book opens that day, too. But Midnight Special, I'm with you, dude. It was in limited release in L.A. and New York, and I wanted to review it, hopefully with Christian. And I was going to go see it, and I couldn't find a theater here to yeah. go see it. Was it playing at one theater at midnight? And I'm like, well, I'll be drunk by midnight. So I didn't go see <laughs> it, and I had to wait. I haven't even seen I might not get to see it this weekend because we got all that cool WonderCon stuff. So I might see it the same day James sees it on April 8th. I'm going to see your special, Drunk by Midnight. <laughs> I'm going to see that in theaters. But uh, the other the other answer, Treadmill, is, you know, they do, <laughs> these, they do these kinds of Treadmill releases. Um, they do it. They did it with, uh, with uh, American Sniper, where they release it early. Early, right. And they do a limited release, and they, it's we always knew that it was going to go wide, but they did that because they wanted to have that Oscar consideration. With something like this, they're still doing that limited release, but what they're doing is they're gauging how many more theaters they're going to want to add right. to the already. So it's limited release. They see how all the you know the bigger cities react to it. It's already scheduled to get a larger release a little bit later, but they can always add or subtract in that area. So unfortunately, you have to wait a little bit, but it'll eventually come to you. You think, yeah, and the thing also with the the, the Oscar push a lot of those times you'll get those that will drop like Revenant by the way Revenant came yeah. out here in like New York and LA in the December limited mm -hmm. and then they push it wide in January and February movies like this to where it drops now in March or April whatever it is, wherever the hell we are I don't know what what is this March, no, March. I don't know um, what is this Russia this isn't Russia yeah. <laughs> so anyway we it, it to release it at that time it is the, a matter of what the audience is saying but I think streaming is really going to change the game and I think that's why this this box thing is starting to cause a, a you guys big... can see midnight special right now come right. out 10 bucks man yeah. what do you got an ice box there I'm gonna go <laughs> really show it hours Hand cut ice hours. from you, son. Then I'm hearing this movie's great, by yeah. the way. I am too. I cannot wait to see it. <laughs> All right, let's see what the next one is. Oh, well, we're going into the live questions. Oh, it's Twitter. That's yeah. right. Okay, I forgot. All right, live Twitter time. So you guys have been sending your tweets over to Miss Mova, the Movenator, aka Electra, and she has been going through these questions. What do you got first? Um, David Price writes, why do studios still believe shorter run times equal more money when some of the highest grossing movies are 130 to 150 minutes? It's all about money, man. It's, it is all about money because it's, it's whether or not look, there are certain movies that are comedies that should not be two hours and 15 minutes or two hours and 20 minutes. There's movies that are about an hour and 30 minutes. Um, but I think sometimes they want it, it. You just you cut back, you cut back on cast, you cut back on on runtime, on script mm -hmm. like it, it's look at Daredevil, by the way, they cut pages of the script because they wanted to cut budget. So it's a matter of, of budget and how much they want to spend on it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's uh, like a, a good a good tight movie, 90 minutes. You get a lot more uh, plays that day, if it, you're, especially over the opening right. weekend, and that's what really counts nowadays, nowadays with movies is that opening weekend box office. So you have a movie coming in at two and a half hours. That's a whole extra hour. It's almost another movie that is playing in that theater. So you're losing about five or six, maybe eight screenings every day. So that's where the consideration of time comes in. Yeah, it's tempting to say, like, oh, if we make our movie longer, it's going to do better. But just think about how much less money those tight 90-minute movies would make if they were 130 to 150 minutes, especially, like, you make horror movies. Like, Sinister 2 is a movie made for opening weekend, and that's it. So I'm pretty sure it was a shorter run time because, mm -hmm. like, we got to get as many plays opening weekend before the reviews come in as we possibly can to make our nut back. Uh, nut bag? <laughs> nut back. Oh, what's next? I'm sure it made some nut bag. <laughs> so I don't have any cash to see the film. How about my nut bag? Could you trade in my nut bag? I have a bag of nuts. Yeah. This bag nice. of nuts, will that do, cashier? Yes, give me the nuts. Here's Ew, the ticket. nut bag. <laughs> right. These are all oh peanuts in yeah. this nut bag. I thought you said there'd be some almonds in that there. That ain't a peanut. Is. That ain't a peanut, kid. Oh, jeez. All right, next. All right, one of the OGs, Bazinga Guy, writes, if Sausage Party is a hit, Whoa. speaking of nutbag, do you, oh, think, yeah. do you think we will see more adult animated films? Um, I hope so, and I hope yes. that these guys do it, and I hope this is funny. I loved that damn trailer, though. It, 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 I loved that trailer. Some people didn't 
like it. Really? I, so I, I saw comments. People thought it was silly, and I'm sure we'll get some in here. Those were all fake comments. Those people don't exist. <laughs> right. Who would hate sausage? Tommy party? Wiseau. Yeah, Tommy Wiseau. Uh, I don't understand it. But he was trying to write that he actually liked it. I, right. I don't lie. I like. I don't lie. I like. I don't lie. Uh, what do you well, think? Well, part of the, part of the appeal. I mean, Sausage Party was a hilarious trailer, even after the reveal. But part of that mystique was that it looks so kid friendly and when they did the turn that's when it's like oh my god i can't believe they're taking this this hardcore r so you're not going to have that with future adult oriented animated movies but i mean even that that's some of my favorite humor is i'm not a big fan of kid cartoons anymore like i'm not going to go home and watch ninja turtles on saturday morning but i still love watching family guy watching simpsons watching even something like bob's burgers mm -hmm. which kids might get a kick out of but they're really made for grown-ups yep yeah, I mean, I love grown-up cartoons. That's why I've been making them for, for many years now. I enjoy watching adult cartoons. And uh, I thought Sausage Party is going to be the gateway drug to opening the door to making more feature films that are R-rated, that are animated, and that are made for strictly for adults. I think that's it looks like that is the film that's going to break break that ice. I mean, I've been trying to like get a heavy metal R-rated movie, animated style, done for years as just even the regular heavy metal guys have been trying to get that done for years. I'm like, how could they make something like that in the 80s? And now we can't make that. And we're in the year 2016. Right. It seems weird, but it's just studios don't want to take it. So it's a risk. And once again, yeah. it's all about money. They don't think that there's an audience there. That's what the, why the studios don't make R-rated cartoons movies is because they don't think there's an audience there. They think, well, unless it's like a family unit, like a family guy or a Simpsons, can you make it a family unit cartoon show? Is that I mean, or a movie? It's like. That's the, the, the fear. So I think Sausage Party is going to, I hopefully will break that fear and give studios like, nope, there is an audience that wants to go see an R-rated film that's a comedy, that's animated, or that's just like an animated R-rated film. So that's what I hope. Well, I will say the majority of the commenters today are excited for Sausage Party. There's a few uh, oh, There's a few people who say, well, Alan D'Souza says, that ah, looks cheesy. Some flaming chinchilla says Sausage Party looks fantastic. <laughs> and then we, yeah, there's, there's a bunch what of What does people. Nutbag oh, have to say? He, right. he left the comment, but I loved C's, C's Films says, Toy Story 4 should be rated R. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, what's next? Unlimited Power writes, after seeing B versus S, do you think it would have fared any better if it had stayed on May 6th? Um, no, 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 it would have probably done worse. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I think it's it's a perfect time for it to come out. It doesn't, yeah. because we still don't know how it's going to fare. It's right. going to, I mean, it, it's going to fare well. Yeah. The movie's going to open yeah. up huge. I, I actually disagree with you. I think I, I'm sticking close to your original prediction. I mm -hmm. think it's going to go close to 200 also. I don't think, because I don't think no matter what, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you guys out there too. Even though maybe maybe you take you you listen to our reviews and when and you're like oh man these guys didn't like it that's gonna bum me out you're still gonna see it or even if normally you're like I don't care what these idiots have to say I'm gonna go see it either way if you wanted to see Batman v Superman you're gonna see it and I know where you're going for more is the word of mouth to where Deadpool people right. who didn't want to see it wanted to see it but I think Batman v Superman alone are gonna pull in enough people to see it so I think the March date. Is perfect. Yeah. Those name brand properties are so huge. And even though we didn't love the movie, I think all of us would be like, you should see this movie in a theater opening weekend. Right. Yeah. Like, it's an event movie. Have fun, dude. It's Batman versus Superman. Go see the damn movie in a theater. But if it was March 6th, it's got so much more competition. I mean, March 25th is going to be owned by this movie. And then next weekend, you have Everybody Wants Some, which is something I'm looking forward to. But I think Batman v Superman is still going to be number one. Maybe even into April 8th. April 15th is when. When the Jungle Book comes out, that's probably going to be the first movie to overtake Batman versus mm. Superman. So I would say the same thing if they were opening Civil War now. Right. You know, I'd be like, yeah, this is a great time to do it because there isn't another train coming for another good three or four weeks. Totally. Shab, what do you think? You think that the, this date is, is the day that should have stayed at? Or I think better? so. No, I think this day is perfectly fine. And yeah, I mean, whether it makes $125 million, $200 million, $250 million, it's going to make a ton of money. Yeah. I think it's going to break a, a, a billion dollars. That's not uh, my issues with the film are not how much money it makes. I don't course, care right. how much money a film makes. I care about the quality of the film. And especially with this film, how is it? setting up all these other films like this film is the very first Batman film with Ben Affleck does this do a good job at setting up our future Batman as Ben Affleck I think yes some people might say no uh, does this do a good job of setting up Just League I'm more on the fence on that one so you know that's I mean whether or not any of those answers of the future films matter it's this film that matters and you know like I said earlier does is the three-hour cut actually gonna make more sense to me and will I like the three-hour cut more 
my gut feeling is yes, I mm. will, because it feels like there's scenes cut out of this movie. So, you know, I mean, we won't know that until we actually see the film. But I think as far as the release date, it's a perfect time to release this movie. You know? right, let's do one more. Okay, Janine L.C. writes, just saw Katherine Heigl in a kitty, little, kitty litter commercial. What can she do to get her film career back on track? Wait, can we, someone's talking about the bathtub. <laughs> Did yeah, you see I saw that it too. What? Can, there's a, I can't read it. What it's, is it? It was a funny comment. No, you gotta but say it. You gotta say it again. No, say. no, I can't. Oh, come on. I can't. Not, not come say on. It. Go to the chat board. Go, just go to the chat board. Okay. Okay. What, what, what is it again? Just saw Katherine Heigl in a kitty litter commercial. What can she do to get her film career back on track? Really? What? Uh, a kitty litter commercial? Yeah, but who cares if she's I in a kitty litter? I bet you she's making litter? bank, I bet she too. made so much money. I bet yeah. you wouldn't be crying about it. And her yeah. crew would be like, if you saw her bank account from that kitty litter, be like, how do I get involved in a kitty, <laughs> kitty litter, litter commercial? commercial? <laughs> how do I become part of this world? Maybe she That's likes maybe, cats. Yeah. Maybe she enjoys cats. Maybe she sleeps in kitty litter. Mind your own business. <laughs> well, that, I have be, no idea. that being said, her career is not doing well right now. Uh, she, she can do... I think if you're gonna with Catherine Heigl, she she's had a she's had a lot of missteps not only with her films but with her antics behind with the things she said about her writers from years ago. Right, from right. Other things, just she's gotten that vibe from people that she's not fun to work with. Now I don't know. I've never met the woman, so I, I just you just you just hear things. Is this a high? But I haven't seen the Kitty Litter commercial, <laughs> so maybe before I say something to you, whoever wrote this thing. Right. I haven't seen it. Is it a high budget? Is it like is she like floating on a kitty litter? Like you know, is a full graphic? You can always what? tell the the quality of the kitty litter by how good of a cat actor they got in the commercial. Because if get? the cat actor is just like like a frumpy faced cat, right. It's a shoestring budget. But if they get like more, remember Morris from oh, Fancy love Feast? Love that him. cat sold tons of products. So Do they have a if Morris? it's a Fancy Feast level Morris cat, then I think Catherine Heigl's doing just fine. Does she have someone to play against who's Morris level? I, dude, nobody's Morris level. They, right. you, Morris's don't just grow on trees. Morris ask somebody who's like they're Morris? once in a generation All talent. Right, man. All right, that's it for today's show. <laughs> Talking about nut bags and bathtub farts, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. What a, what a show today! Uh, I would like to thank everyone on the table today. First of all, <laughs> have fun in Florida, buddy. <laughs> John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can the people find you? Well, you can find me inside cat litter, <laughs> hanging out with Morris, a, a, a globule of Morris. What's left of him? We're friends. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Nutbag. <laughs> no, you can't. Uh, just at John Schnepp uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Check out my Kickstarter, Sweaties Unite, Rise of the Uber Nerd. It's all about comic books. And uh, see you later. Sitting next to me, am I right? <laughs> oh Man, I really got you, huh? You guys can find me eating chili in a bathtub this weekend at WonderCon <laughs> at Mark Ellis Live. We will be at WonderCon all weekend. We have our fan meetup Saturday night right after John Schnapp's Heroes panel. Yeah. Come on over to the Lux Hotel, <laughs> second floor. And I just put up on Facebook, so check my Twitter and the Twitter. <laughs> Check and I Dennis's forgot, Twitter. WonderCon, room 152, uh, 7.30. We're doing the Heroes panel. Come by. We're going to talk about everything except nutbags and kitty litter. I'll be cutting nice lies. Ice cutter Mark Ellis will be there in the back. All right. And Ashley Mova, where can I find you? On Twitter and on Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. All right. Big, big show launching on <laughs> Friday. It is Campia versus Merle, the debut of the Schmodown movie trivia. Guys, this is going to be a slobber knocker. That's right. It is going to be a big, big battle between these two. They are going to try to get into title contention. But I just put a poll up on my Twitter feed, and it's just asking who you think is going to win. Go there and vote. It's at Christian Harloff on Twitter. Make sure that you also hashtag Schmodown and get your questions in because Miss Mova over there is going to be reading your tweets Thank on the you. debut episode. So share your opinions. <laughs> let us know what you think. And then join us every day here on Movie Talk. Thanks. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.